And thanks for your time. Uh, this afternoon, judicial independence is dominating the agenda. The uh, Ghanaian lawyers and members of the judiciary converge for the 2023 bar conference in Cape Coast. Uh, President Kufado uh, is making that argument that it will be irresponsible and dangerous for former President John Romani Mahama to claim that he has tilted the composition of the courts by appointing more than 80 NPP aligned judges. The Chief Justice uh, also followed through, uh, insisting that the judiciary remains an independent arm of the state. However, the Ghana Bar Association is uh, equally worried that partisanship is beginning to eat deep into the fabrics of the legal profession. Uh, well, uh, there's a need for us uh, to get you the very latest of all that's happened today and what the position uh, of the Ghana Bar Association uh, is uh, with respect to uh, the conference uh, which transpired uh, earlier today. First, though, let's listen to President Kofado make his speech earlier today. Appointments to the lower courts, the high court and the court of appeal are done by the president exclusively on the advice of the Judicial Council. In the case of appointments to the Supreme Court, because of its unique position in our judicial structure, there are the additional requirements of the consultation of the Council of State and the approval of Parliament. In the overwhelming number of cases of justices designate to the Supreme Court, that approval has been given on a bipartisan basis. You can count on the fingers of a hand the number of justices designate whose approval meant less than unanimous consent. I've gone into this matter in some detail because of a new concept that has been recently introduced into our public discourse by no less a public figure than the fourth president of the fourth republic, the perennial NDC presidential candidate, John Dramani Mahama. <laughs> who has told the world that I have packed the courts with so-called MPP judges and that one of the key purposes of a putative NDC victory in 2024 will be to enable him balance the courts with so-called NDC judges. Not only are these concepts of, quote, MPP and, quote, NDC judges, new in our public discourse. They are also extremely dangerous and represent the most brazen attack on the independence of the judiciary by an allegedly responsible politician of the Fourth Republic. They provide another reason, if more were needed, why right-thinking citizens should ensure the defeat in 2024 of the man whom the first special prosecutor identified as government official number one in the still unresolved airport airbus bribery scandal. Well, let's uh, now bring in uh, the PRO for the Ghana Bar Association, uh, Sevia Kuja, who's joining us via Zoom now. Thank you, sir, uh, for your time. Uh, of course, this is just the start of uh, you know, a number of conversations that will be uh, ongoing. Uh, as part of the 2023 uh, Ghana Bar Conference. But, but, but let's start off with the concerns that you have as a bar as well. It's not just the president who's concerned about how partisanship is creeping into uh, the judiciary. You are equally concerned that this is also eating deep into the profession, the legal profession itself. Uh, what, what trends and form is this taking, and why is the Ghana Bar Association concerned about this? Well, thank you, and uh, good afternoon to your viewers and listening. Uh, we are concerned because, uh, you know, certain things may be said by lay people, but as lawyers, once we are present, we ought to uh, not let that happen. Uh, lawyers have, we all belong to the Ghana Bar Association, but a group of lawyers can decide to form other associations within uh, the Bar Association. That is their right. But uh, our concern is that if uh, they are addressed as uh, such gatherings, and uh, they should be able to point out uh, certain things that are not said right. And you you feel that this is just coming from a particular group of individuals, uh, or, or this is uh, much more than just one group? I, I think so far the trend we've seen is uh, to have, um, I think last year it happened at the same gathering of uh, 
people, some lawyers who identify themselves with the NDC. And mm -hmm. this year, too, it has happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so let's get to it then. Uh, if you, if you, of course, uh, argue that this is uh, much more, uh, you know, about questioning the the integrity or the, the the you know the sanctity of the profession which you belong to, uh, which is law. Uh, how does you know these groups, the emergence of the group, affect you know the professionalism, which is much more an independent uh, matter or left to the individual uh, who would then be practicing? How do you respond to that? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not good for us. It doesn't augur well for, for us because uh, there are young lawyers uh, passing out every year who join the, uh, our, our association. And uh, if such examples should continue, we cannot build a good association and for that matter, a good nation. I say this because, as I said, our uh, uh, ethics uh, even enjoin us not to do things to denigrate more or less uh, the practice of law. So, ever where we practice our trade, the judiciary is, is brought on uh, in a certain light. And uh, there are lawyers there. Uh, my respectful view is that those lawyers should be able to draw the lay people's attention to that. Because so far, these things are not being said by any lawyer, but rather uh, people of uh, high stature, but who are laymen as far as the law is concerned, or the legal profession is concerned. Mm. And we know that uh, as an association, you're equally concerned uh, about uh, some matters, not, not just uh, related to only your body, uh, but also out of the association. So let's uh, quickly get back to the address that your uh, president delivered. Uh, what are the key demands you're making uh, as part of this year's bar conference? Well, we, we've spoken uh, extensively about corruption and uh, Galamse as well. Corruption, I, unfortunately, the president wasn't there listen to the day he had left but i believe his lieutenants were there so they had listened uh, president uh, gave an account of what he's done so far as a president in the uh, fight of corruption and uh, my uh, the bar's position is that yes he may have done a lot but we think that a lot more ought to have been done or always ahead of us to do so he should just raise up and do that and then the about Galamse, of course, yeah, you know, it's not only about destruction of the environment. It affects our economy. It get, brings about diseases and all that. So uh, our president, uh, the bad passed on that through the bad president too. And then uh, President Kuvado also said, uh, even though he said um, uh, President Hama didn't do well and all that, I admit, fine, that was all. But uh, the only aspect I have a little concern about is going ahead to aid people to more or less vote against him on that. I, I don't think that it was proper for him to use the platform for that because uh, uh, condemning what President Mahama said, many more people uh, have already done it. The Ghana Bar Association to have done it. But to go ahead to say that uh, because of his, uh, people should uh, more or less vote against him, I, I think that to me amounted to doing, doing some political campaign on our platform, which uh, to me is, is not acceptable. Uh, so, so you, you're taking issues uh, with that, and, and that will follow through with a statement to, to clarify matters? No, no, I think that once I'm granting this interview to you, this should suffice, because um, uh, it's the same medium that we use to uh, propagate our statement, and uh, I'm sure a lot of media houses were there. So to retreat, I am saying that, yes, President Kufuado has spoken about the statement by, made by President Mahama, on the alleged appointment of uh, MPP people onto the bench by him. But I don't think that it was proper for him also to use the bar conference during his address to say that because of what President Mahama has said, uh, he was urging uh, well-meaning citizens to vote against him or less. Uh, because I don't think that our platform should have used for that. Mm. And, and it's part of the criticisms that you constantly face. I recall having a, uh, a conversation with you, uh, where, of course, uh, the Director of Legal Affairs for the NDC was also uh, joining that conversation. Uh, the part of the claims was that uh, the Ghana Bar Association appears to be leaning much more to the governing side, uh, a reason for which you're accused of siding with, with the government on national issues. Uh, don't you feel that this could also go a long way to taint your image as, a, as, a, as an association? Well, I, I didn't, I think there was a break along the line, but what I had, I'll respond to it. Let me, let me say that it would be totally unfair to say that we have constantly offered the sitting president, President Kufuado, 
uh, to speak against the other side of the political divide on our platform. That is unfair because, first and foremost, we don't prepare his speeches. We are not his speech writers. And I'm yet to know of a protocol where you have invited somebody to come and address you, then you elect or you seek to vet whatever other person is coming to speak, to speak about. No, we don't do that. I don't think that is proper. That is why I have taken the opportunity to say that, yes, he came today, he condemned what President Mahama said about the appointment to the bench, as we also did. But he went ahead to urge well-meaning citizens to vote against his party or him come 2024, and that we condemn. And, and, so it is never, yes. and we could have, we can invite any person who is sitting as president to come and invite us. As just that President Kufuor has a unique relationship with that. This is a man when he was in opposition was only always with us. Why then has he become a president? And we should cut him off. And any time we invite him, he comes. If he says he won't come, for, today for instance, he was built for another assignment, but he managed to come around before going. So. That we don't have any exceptional treatment for anybody when it comes to our conferences. Did you extend a special invitation to former President John Romani Mahama, knowing that, um, of course, the Chief Justice was going to be present, and that could have provided, you know, a, a very fair platform uh, for, if not open, it could be backroom, you know, engagements to to clear the the concerns the former President has. Was that done? That wasn't done because. Um, because we had already uh, spoken about the matter, his spokespeople came to defend it. So what, what then would be there to ask for, for us to discuss? Because they justified it. If you remember, you, I think you were the host of Top Story, uh, the day I granted an interview together with uh, Mr. Tamaklo Eduji. And Tamaklo was of the view that Mr. Mahama had said it, we either leave it or take it. With that, such a posture, what is there to discuss? I see. Um, well, that's an interesting point there. Uh, but okay, moving forward, corruption has also come up. Your leader speaking about um, you know corruption and how that's uh, affecting uh, national development. The president says he's taking the boldest decision when it comes to uh, the subject matter of corruption since independence. Are you buying that as the Ghana Bar Association? Well, I, I don't know how he came to that conclusion, but there's nothing wrong with taking steps. So steps you can take, but as to whether you've achieved results is another matter. Because what I know is that nobody measures efforts. It's results that we measure. So what the Ghana Association is saying that the president may have taken steps by referring his appointees against whom various allegations had been made to the requisite or the uh, administrative bodies and uh, institutions that uh, had to investigate them, and they were investigated and uh, uh, no wrongdoings and fun against them. But has that solved the problem? To me, no. But I might also, I must also say that the president has gone ahead to make, make a recommendation for reforms as far as the laws on corruption and bribery are concerned. If you remember, I haven't granted an interview and I said the only way to me that we should get to the bottom of fighting corruption is to look at our laws. Why do we have a law that says that the giver and the taker are equally guilty? To my mind, the guilt should be limited to the taker, so that the taker may not even know that he's been set up by an opponent. Then we can make some heavy. But if it remains the way it is, I don't think that we'll get anywhere. And as it stands now, you're not impressed with the fight so far? As far as his conduct, as uh, procedurally, he has uh, satisfied all the requirements because as a president, if allegations are made against your appointees, you have no business... Uh, dealing with them, yours is to uh, refer them to the relevant bodies. So if they are not found capable by the relevant bodies, I don't see why anybody should blame him. If he refuses to refer them to the relevant bodies for uh, investigation or the necessary uh, uh, things to be uh, uh, dealing to be done on them, that one we can say he's shielding them. Unless we are saying that he has uh, uh, some dealings with those institutions, which I don't think is fair. Nobody should go that way. Okay, uh, Sylvia, after the conference uh, this week, what will be that charge for your members to keep as, the Ghana, uh, as members of the Ghana Bar Association? Well, they should also they should only remember that we are one fraternity. Nobody should break us up. The lay people, the politicians should not divide us. They should know that they have every right to practice politics. The first and foremost, as my president said today, their fidelity should be first to the law because they may even have become president, uh, had to go politicians just because they are lawyers. I see. And uh, I'm sure that will reconnect uh, 
in the coming days. Grateful uh, for speaking to uh, Sylvia Kujet, uh, is the PRO of the Ghana Bar Association. Uh, in a very harrowing uh, incident, Sunday night, a 50-year-old truck driver narrowly uh, escaped death uh, as uh, his cargo uh, laden truck crashed into uh, one of the uh, boots at the Accra Toll Plaza, leaving his tire in ruins. The uh, activity, the unfortunate incident, actually comes merely uh, four days after he, uh, the Ghana Highways Authority uh, handed over the site to a contractor uh, for the commencement of some demolition work on that uh, expressway. The driver, grappling with the aftermath, blamed uh, the contractor citing woeful uh, or inadequate warning signs as the reasons for which uh, he had to crash. Listen. Last night I was from this in Kumasi. So when I, I reached by the this in the reflector is too close. I, I and then one track to when to come by, you see that ties appear the this in the road. So I want to dis- defend myself and then defend the track. So my two rims out at uh, uh, spoil and then the addition, the, my three tires who was blast. If the toe is not needed, you should remove the toe on the uh, uh, way. Because if you want to be a, this toe and always killing people, and Sunday's incident is reinforcing calls uh, for the motorway to be fixed. And uh, while well, bringing us details on this uh, ongoing demolition exercise, is Joseph Atu and Major Kez, the Director of Road Safety and Environment at the Ghana Highways Authority. Thank you, sir, uh, for joining us. Uh, last week, we were, of course, elated that you pledged that you would complete this project within a period of 14 days. Um, just day four, and of course, this unfortunate incident is happening. What, what updates can you bring us as to uh, how far you're going about with the uh, repair works at the Toll Plaza? Uh, hello, Joseph. You would have to unmute so we can hear the points you're sharing with us. Hello? Yes, loud and clear now. I was just asking about uh, the progress of work, knowing that Sunday, of course, another unfortunate incident happened. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like we indicated, uh, we are. Uh, uh, hello, Joseph. If you're with us, um, y- yes, Joseph. If, if you can hear me, I'm just asking you to take that point for us again about the update. Uh, and Joseph Amajak is the uh, Director of uh, Safety at the Ghana Highways Authority, uh, joining us uh, on this latest incident uh, that uh, occurred Sunday, uh, just uh, after, uh, you know, that mounting pressure on the Ghana Highways Authority for uh, work, repair works to be done. Uh, Joseph, let's try one more time. I was just asking about the updates on the work, knowing that last Sunday, of course, we witnessed another incident. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me, uh, Joseph. Uh, we're just uh, working the lines to get through to uh, Joseph Amijaga, who's uh, you know, in charge of safety at the Ghana Highways Authority. But the pictures you see there of uh, that haulage track being um, repaired, obviously because of Sunday's incident, um, where, of course, another um, near-fatal accident was recorded at this very spot. You see the toll plaza. Uh, on the Accra Tama motorway. The concerns are immense, first of all, ranging on the issues about safety, the need to expand uh, the stretch, and also uh, the need to get the toll points cleared because government is no longer taking the uh, to- tolls at, the, at that point. Uh, it's raising visibility issues, the reason for which uh, drivers are concerned and also uh, you know, asking for some uh, re- immediate works to commence on that. We'll get you updates shortly. When we get back from the break, uh, and uh, of course, we'll tell you more about some uh, other happenings uh, here. You're watching The Pulse. We'll be right back. In a nation where the power distributor is highly indebted, a sinister syndicate lurks in the shadows as greed infiltrates the heart of Ghana's power supply. 
Join us on a riveting journey as we uncover the shocking truth behind ECG meter allocations. Corruption, deceit, and betrayal. It's a tale that will leave you asking why. This thing is a big moral responsibility and values fight. Meet up headless. Coming soon on Joy News. Imagine a family without a home. Hello, my name is Abeku Agri Santana. If there's anything that makes my life so easy, it is my bank. I love hanging out with my boys' boys at our usual fufu joint. But even without cash, we still the chop better with Ecobank Mobile. No matter the time of day, my bank helps me stay in touch with my beautiful wife whenever she's away. And when my beautiful wife is in town, she never misses out on her favorite TV shows because I'm able to pay up all my TV subscriptions from the comfort of my mobile phone. Whenever she has to get groceries too, my bank makes it cashless and convenient. And the part my wife loves the most is when my bank makes it possible and easy for her to shop from any part of the world without moving. <laughs> Welcome to the smart world of Ecobank. Download Ecobank Mobile from Google Play Store, all the apps store and discover the smart way to bank. Ecobank, the Pan-African bank. From humble beginnings to the extraordinary. We've witnessed incredible bonds. The rise of legends in the most challenging of times. And the most unforgettable moments that kept us at the edge of our seat. Everything up till now was just the beginning. Legends go head to head as timelines have collapsed for the ultimate showdown. Welcome to Big Brother Niger All Stars. Starts 23rd July. Headline sponsor, Money Point. Daddy? Daddy? This tank is big! Yes, that's true. It can store a lot of water. That's so true. Wow, it has a working surface on it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I can see S I N T E X syntax. That is so true, my daughter. When it falls down, it will spoil you. That's not true. But why? Why? <laughs> Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Syntex again was the first to introduce white inner layers in Ghana. Syntex gives you the biggest warranty seven years. No matter your water needs, Syntex is the answer. Syntex tank. Are you strong? Are you tough? Smile, hmm? Look lively, okay? Smile, smile! Is the money too small? A bad stomach ruins your day. Don't let it. Take Gastron, your most effective antacid, for the relief of symptoms of peptic ulcer, heartburn, gas pain, flatulence, and indigestion. Hey guys, what are you waiting for? Let's go, let's go. Mwah. Can you bring down that smile more? <laughs> Gastro, effective relief from stomach discomfort. Manufactured and distributed by NS Chemist Limited. This advertisement has been written and approved by the FDA. The Botech Registration Exercise 2023 is here with us now. The Electoral Commission is making preparations for voters' registration exercise from 12 September to 2nd October 2023 to enable citizens who have turned 18 years or persons who have not previously registered to visit the EC office in their district and register as a voter ahead of the upcoming district-level elections 2023. 
The registration exercise is in line with the Commission's mandate to compile the register of voters and revise it at such periods as may be determined by law. Every eligible Ghanaian should visit the EC office in their district and present their Ghana card or passport for inclusion in the voter's register. Applicants who do not have a Ghana card or passport are required to bring two persons who are already registered voters to guarantee their registration. Do not register again if you have lost your voter ID card. Replacement of voter ID cards will start from 3rd October 2023 after the registration exercise. Transfer of votes will also be done from 3rd October to 9th October 2023. It is a criminal offense for a guarantor to guarantee for more than 10 people, non ghanaians and persons who are not 18 years of age. Guarantors who violate this provision will be prosecuted. The voters' registration exercise is part of efforts to ensure credible, transparent and peaceful elections in Ghana. Register to vote. Your vote is your power. The voters' registration exercise 2023 is here with us now. Imagine a family without a home. Imagine a song without a voice. Imagine a church without prayers. Imagine a government without citizens. Imagine democracy without journalists. Imagine a world without the media. Life is full of issues and stories. Communities and governments. Stories that have to be told by well-trained journalists. That's why you can't imagine news without Joy News. Thanks for uh, staying with us uh, here on uh, the Joy News Channel. The, the minority in uh, Parliament says uh, that the police is deliberately obstructing, obstructing them from going ahead with their planned protest tomorrow. Now, they're accusing uh, the central bank governance of mismanaging, uh, mismanagement leading to um, you know, the uh, losses which are incurred and negatively uh, impacted on the livelihoods of Ghanaians and are therefore uh, using uh, the protest uh, to mount pressure uh, for their resignation despite an inconclusive meeting uh, between the minority and the Ghana Police Service which aimed at reaching a truce on the route to use for that protest. The minority has indicated its readiness to proceed uh, with the protest. Uh, there's more in this report. The meeting between the minority and the Ghana Police Service ended inconclusively as the route for tomorrow's demonstration was not agreed. However, the Deputy Minority Leader, Emmanuel Amakofibwa, told the media that despite these challenges, they will go ahead with the demonstration. The police service of Ghana, the regional police command, could not tell us where the limits are. We have even made compromise and suggested, okay, since the Bank of Ghana is the security zone, and you couldn't even tell us the limits today, it's very clear to us that the police are just doing everything to trample on our rights as Ghanaians, as representatives of the people of Ghana, and especially our right guaranteed in this constitution to protest. So it is clear for us that we've done everything we can to work with the police. This police will not work with us. They are not ready to even listen to us. They are not ready to compromise with us. But we are clear in our minds 
that we have the right to protest and we will do so. MP for Boko Central, Mahama Yarga, says there's no law that gives the police that power to prevent them from going on demonstration. We have a right to demonstrate and we will demonstrate. We have an issue with the central bank and we will go to the central bank. So let's deal with their first issue, which is the route. So we went back to the route that they initially proposed, which is that we should start from Obra Sport, go through Adaka, and then their initial termination point was Independence Square. So we said, okay, we are accepting your route. We will start from Obra Sport, we will go through Adabraka, pass through Ridge Runabout, and then go and pass through um, the National Theatre, and then hit the Atamils Highway, and then head towards the Bank of Ghana building. Two, and they agreed. They agreed to the route, okay? Then we said the second, so once there's agreement on the route, let's resolve the third issue, which is the termination point. Yeah. You are saying we should turn and go and terminate at uh, Independence Square. We say no. We don't have an issue with the independence of Ghana. Our issue is with the Bank of Ghana. The demonstration comes off tomorrow, but with different routes. The minority is expected to pour on the streets of Accra to register their revulsion against governance of the Bank of Ghana for posting losses in the 2022 audited report. Reporting for Joy News, Samuel Mbura. Greater Accra Police Command, Accra. Well, uh, fortunately, Samuel Mbura is uh, joining us uh, back in the studio as we understand there's an update on the story where minorities are beginning to change their mind on the protest. Uh, Sami, what's the uh, you know, update from the minority and w- what are they indicating at this point? So the update is that the protest has been postponed to 3rd October following an agreement between the Ghana Police Service and then the minority. So they've now reached a truce on the route that they will take for this protest, but as to the exact route that they will take, it has uh, We understand this was part of the reason for which um, you know, the issues ended up in court. Why um, is there a difficulty at just arriving on you know, one simple um, route to use, and, and why is the minority resisting the attempts, what they describe as the attempt by the police to... Um, you know, prevent the, the work from taking So the Ghana Police Service has cited security reasons as to why they cannot allow them to use the, the route they yeah. were proposing mm-hmm. uh, in front of a parliament through to um, Makola and some of the primary areas in Accra. Yeah. They'll end at the Bank of Ghana where they'll present the petition. They were expecting that the governors themselves will come and take the petition. If not, they wouldn't leave the premises. Yeah. So because of the security concerns from the Ghana Police Service, that's why they had to go to court uh, to restrain them. However, there was a misnomer with the application that they placed before Parliament. I mean, the, the court. The court directed that instead of titling it uh, the Republic versus the Minority, it should have been the Ghana Police Service versus the Minority. So they were given a one week uh, time mm-hmm. period to go and then change that misnomer and come back. But this meeting uh, today that was held earlier was to reach a truce on the routes that they will go. Uh, with um, for the protest tomorrow, but it didn't. It ended inconclusive. But after we had left, there was another meeting with the police, and then they arrived at the the new routes that they'll be uh, embarking on on the third of October. So, so what's what's the agreement now? Do we have a clear sense of uh, where, where the protest? I mean, the routes they'll, they'll be using, and w- whether or not they are reverting to what the police had originally proposed. At the moment, we don't have the exact route for this uh, protest, but what we are getting is that they have agreed on the route. I know subsequently they will definitely... So what will be the implication of this, that the protest will still happen tomorrow? No, the protest wouldn't come tomorrow. They have to... That's why I said they have reached the truth. Yeah. So by the 3rd of October, they might have um, I mean, removed all the strings before they can go ahead with the, with the protest. But initially, they were confident that it would go or it would take off tomorrow. However... There are changes, and it will come off on the third of. And you've been engaging uh, some of the leading uh, members of, um, you know, the, the this is supposed to be an alliance, not just uh, from the minority side, exactly. but other groups are also interested in this whole uh, protest. What sense do you get from them as to, you know, this insistence on trying as much as possible? to go to the POG when indeed they have other means of registering their concerns? Yeah, so several groups are part of it. It's not just the minority, the Arise Ghana and other civil society organizations. I've also been told that uh, market women drivers will be joining 
this particular demonstration or protest okay. against the governors of Bank of Ghana. Their claim is that they have posted losses uh, as witnessed in the 2022 audited reports, and these losses have affected negatively on the livelihood of Ghanaians. The reason they have to hit the street and then vent their revulsion against the governors of Bank of Ghana for mismanaging the economy, allegedly. They are also accusing them of allegedly um, printing some money that have contributed to the current economic mess in the country. A reason they are still insisting that the whole world must know that this is what the Bank of Ghana governments have done to the economy. So we have to expose them. They have other alternatives, such as going to parliament, calling them to come. But they have been given the sufficient information about it. But they still think that let's pause to a street and register our anger. And you've been speaking to the likes of uh, Bernard Mona. Um, are they not certain or convinced or having that confidence that at least by October 3, things would have changed? The you know, economy would, would be in a much more better position by then? Are they, they, are, not they, are not, they are not getting any indication mm -hmm. of that because they think that, I mean, the evidence are there to show. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you have seen or you look at the uh, performance of the economy yeah. and what the auditor report is saying, they think that that is a reasonable grounds to protest against their management. They think that it is a, a clear mismanagement of the economy. Yeah. There is no any positive signal that there's going to be any positive change and all that. So that is why they are still resolute to go on this particular demonstration against the uh, governors of the Bank of Ghana, not just the governor, but the board members uh, as well. So their main or, I mean, target is for them to resign. They think that resigning will be the ultimate goal in solving the economic challenges that we have in the country. But the last time I engaged the vice chairman for the Parliamentary um, Committee on Finance, Mr. Patrick uh, Buama, he was of the view that the minority could have used different um, avenues to table their concerns, even though they have already been given sufficient information as to why the Bank of Ghana performed that way. Uh, but they think that going to the extreme of uh, publicly demonstrating against the Bank of Ghana will send a signal of lack of confidence in the economy at the time that Ghana is still in negotiation with IMF on some of the debt negotiation and all that. So the, the, the general plea from the minority, uh, majority in government is that at least the minority can look at a different um, avenue to table their concerns, either than hitting the streets to publicly um, okay. vent their anger. Uh, finally, any word from the Ghana Police Service? Well, the Ghana Police Service, you know, per their instruction now, they don't speak to the media. They don't, uh, it is later that they may be issuing a statement that will be published on their official Facebook page or any of their outlets that will get to know what happened. But for now, the police wouldn't talk to us. But the indication I've gotten from the protesters is that they don't have trust in the Ghana Police Service. They think that they have been uh, I mean, they used yeah. to frustrate their purposes. I mean, their uh, attempts to demonstrate. Yeah, demonstrate. Yeah. Okay, Samin so, mean, we'll put the latest uh, on this protest and we'll definitely bring you updates. Uh, but frantic efforts are being made now uh, to find managers of uh, STA, uh, that's uh, Stanham's uh, Enterprise, uh, 48 hours after an explosion uh, at the quarry company site, uh, which has actually claimed some five uh, people already. Uh, there are calls for the Minerals Commission and the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, uh, to be held responsible and accountable for the massive explosion that uh, occurred within this community, a suburb of the, uh, you know, uh, Andok Chrome uh, in the western region. Uh, this actually follows the Mineral Commission's uh, admission that the company... Uh, which we're talking about, the Stardom's Enterprise, was operating illegally. Uh, the Western Regional Minister has set up a, a multidisciplinary committee already to establish uh, the cause of this explosion that was witnessed. In Natalia Kwanza uh, is uh, joining us now uh, with uh, more on what we're learning about this very uh, latest incident. Uh, in Natalia, what we see on the screens now is supposed to be uh, the site, correct? Uh, tell us what has happened ever since, uh, you know, investigations started. Yes, bless. so um, ever since the explosion happened on Saturday um, around 11 p.m., what has happened is that the place has been guarded. Um, EPA says that initially we thought there was going to be an excavation so that they could find out if there were more people who were involved in the um, death or who were involved. But EPA says that there is this fear that the ammonia or whatever explosive uh, had, you know, triggered this explosion, there might be some in the ground, and so there wouldn't be any... Uh, in, in Italia? Um, 
chief, I was also at a place this morning, and like the Western Regional Minister has said, the nine-member committee is to start work immediately and then bring a full detail of what could have accounted for this explosion within three weeks. Uh, and Atara, how about, you know, the committee set up by, by the minister? Um, what findings are, are they also making there, perhaps pointing to what we, we are already learning from our sources or otherwise? Well, it's, it's the same thing. So just like the Minerals Commission is saying that this um, company is not licensed, they feel it's explosive, which could have caused this, but they want the committee to do an in-depth investigation and then come out with their report before there is any conclusion as to whether it was an explosive or not. And you were pointing out to us uh, the, the other time, or just uh, earlier uh, this morning, uh, about how the residents believe that this is not the first of its kind and that the, the enterprise has been operating at night, allegedly. This, these are all claims that we're hearing of. How, how true are these allegations? Yes, so... Uh, Bless, um, we, uh, when we play the sound of the Minerals Commission board, you could also hear him say that they sometimes pick up um, um, intelligence that these people are working, but when you come, it's not really what seems on the ground. And they, they are um, press released this morning. It pointed out that, I mean, the Minerals Commission pointed out that that is what they've been taking up as well, but it seems that that is, is not because these people work at night, just like um, what happened. The explosive or the explosion happened at night, 11 p.m. And so in the morning, it seems these people are not working. But later um, in the night, these people get to work. And so the allegations seem to be true. The allegations by the community members seem to be very true. Mm. And, and uh, we know that the Western Regional Minister has also been commenting on this. Uh, what, what statement has he been making? Well, the Regional Minister yesterday said emphatically that per, um, in this, per what he has as the Regional Security Council, it has been confirmed that these people do not have um, license. They do not have the need, so they are operating illegally. Bless, I must say that um, these people, are, according to my sources, at the Shema District Office, have been working for the past six months mm. at the blind side of authority. Uh, did you say six months? Six months, less. So how come they were not discovered? Well, so, uh, so what uh, the Minerals Commission and authorities have put out there, they say that these people claim that they are not working. And so you go there in the morning, it seems they are just these preparatory stages. And the place where it got, you know, exploded happens to be um, where they, they are supposed to accommodate their workers. It's an accommodation site. Mm, I see. Uh, let's, let's listen in to, to, to the um, Western Regional Minister uh, explain matters further. Um, I believe that um, we need to be intensify our monitoring of all the sites that we have. Um, the other one was like gold, but this one is a quarry. Um, if we perspective of that, they are all mining sites, and we need to look at our safety, critically. Um, my information is that the Minerals Commission has not gone through the, all the process with them. So um, now that we are doing an investigation, we should be able to catch up with the owners of the mine, and then go forward, investigate, and see exactly what is happening already. And we are aware that four people have died, and then under four are injured. Um, two or three of them are in critical condition. One is better, but two, the other two is very critical, and one has been discharged. Um, um, it's, we have to send our heartfelt uh, condolences to the family of all those who have lost their lives because of this incident. But I strongly believe that um, we need to intensify our, our uh, inspections. Um, on all the mining sites um, that we have. This is an old mine, and I believe that they should have been doing the right thing. Uh, the fire service is here, the police is here, and then they'll be, they are doing their investigations. Um, if you look at the way the bodies have been touched because of the blast, uh, you could actually feel the impact 
um, of the blast um, on the mine. But I believe that we'll be able um, to get to the bottom of the cause of the of the incidents and put in the remedies that are needed. With my information from the Minerals Commission is that they have not been fully licensed. So I believe that is part of the process. I don't know how they got um, started mining without a full complement um, of their licenses. But I also do believe that if they knew that they have started the process, they should have been also be monitoring them um, as we are going through the process. Uh, well, so in Italia, do we know what will happen after today? Well, we are, we are all waiting um, for what the committee would say. Um, I understand that the interior minister, that's what I'm picking up from the grounds that he's supposed to be here. So we are waiting for that. Mm. Uh, so, so the interior minister is will be in the community to to you know also help out with the investigations. What what exactly is he expected to do? I do not have details of his visit, but when I visited the community this morning, that's what I, I was picking from the ground that the interior minister would be visiting. And then just like yesterday, we did indicate that. Um, um, four of the Chinese nationals are still on the run. I mean, the police are still looking for these people. I must also say, bless that for my investigation, my thoughts, I got to, um, I got the information that um, the company is a joint partnership by a Ghanaian and then a Chinese national. That was what I picked up from the ground when I was there yesterday and today. Mm. Uh, and, and how about claims that, uh, you know, because the minister was just pointing that out, that this is an old site, it's not necessarily new. So how come there's a new ownership? How come it's becoming uh, a new company? Yes, so, let's, uh, so if um, we, we looked at the, the report from the Minerals Commission, and then from what I have personally picked up, the site originally was for Omini Quarry, and so these new people are just um, taking or they are new partners taking over from Omni Query. That's how come this is not a new site. Okay, so uh, the, the new company bought this off? Yes. A and they've been operating, as you're pointing out, for, for the last six months? Or, or I mean, this was the, the previous company? That's what I picked previous... up from the community. Uh, but how about the accounts from, from the Forestry uh, uh, Commission? Is it the Forestry Commission or the EPA pointing out that, you know, some cleaning procedures were being undertaken by this new company is the reason for which, you know, uh, they were found on site. How, how do we re reconcile the two? Let's, can you come again? I, I was just talking about the accounts of the authorities and what also you're picking up. Uh, the authorities say that they were just uh, carrying out regular cleaning and inspection uh, work ahead of, you know, full takeover of this quarry site. How do we just oppose these two accounts that we're hearing? Yes, so bless uh, what the authority is saying and that for the um, press release we had from the Minerals Commission this morning, they did confirm that, yes, um, the administrator of the company said that they were working ostensibly at, at the blind side of authorities just to prevent um, authorities from knowing. For it's not just authorities, but also um, the sun women and ferry associations within the district. And so, yes, um, authorities know that it's a preparatory stage, but these people end up working at night. Mm. I see. Uh, that, that must be really concerning. But uh, we're grateful for the updates that you're giving us, uh, Natalia Kwanza. Uh, they're giving us updates. And we know that the Interior Minister uh, will be there uh, in a few hours from now. So we'll see uh, what, what you know, the uh, updates will be. But, of course, we'll keep our eyes there for you. We now take you to the Techiman municipality because residents there uh, within the Bono East region are appealing to city authorities to institute measures uh, capable of uh, solving, um, you know, the municipality's flooding challenges. The residents who were speaking to join news after less than 30 minutes of rainfall attributed poor drainage along with some along the principal streets of Techiman as the major cause of flooding within the municipality. And as it now reports. Poor drainage systems in towns and cities contribute immensely to flooding. 
the drains and gutters constructed in the Dejima municipality are not large enough to, to ensure easy flow of water during rainy days, and this is one of the main causes of floods along the principal streets of the municipality. Residents are calling for the intervention of city authorities after some parts of the city was nearly flooded after less than 30 minutes of rainfall. The drainage constructed is too small, so the water overflows onto the streets, making it difficult for us to cross. So we are appealing to authorities to help us find a lasting solution to this matter. It is always difficult for us as drivers whenever it trains. I was unable to cross this afternoon and had to use a different route around the main market. So we are all not spared, both drivers and Okada riders, because the rain water gets into our vehicles, and that is worrying, so we are appealing for help. It's been so for the past four or five years since the construction of this road. This is even smaller. When it gets worse, you are even at risk of being carried away. Motorists are always at risk during rainy days and school children find it difficult crossing the streets as a result of the situation. Especially so talk a it may check us. When it rains heavily, it drags vehicles. Sometimes it causes accidents. The MC and the member of parliament to come to our aid before something terrible happens. Though authorities have over the years taken cosmetic measures to help address the situation, these presidents want a lasting solution to the current situation. Honourable MP. We are appealing to the MP and the MC to carry out a renovation work on this part of the road because it's not good for us. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichima. And now that the district chief executive uh, for Mampurugu uh, Manduri in the northeast region, uh, that's uh, Bu Adams, has denied the allegations that uh, mining uh, uh, equipment that was uh, confiscated from uh, the illegal mining firm uh, in the area has been sold by the assembly. The equipment, including excavators and a tipper track, were uh, said to have been seized by the security forces during an anti galamse uh, operation within the area. According to the uh, allegations, the DC also failed to account for an unspecified uh, quantity of gold that was seized within uh, the operation period. Reacting to the allegations, however, the DC said that the seized equipment was in the custody of the regional coordinating directorate. Correspondent Ilya Sutanko now reports. Nankuma is a small village located in the Mampuku Mwaduri district in the northwestern part of the northeast region, originally inhabited by the people of the Koma ethnic tribe, and shares a direct border with the Upper West region to the north and the Upper East region to the east. The community is endowed with a large deposit of gold, which for many years, in addition to subsistence farming, had been a major source of livelihood for the residents who had always engaged in a small and restricted form of mining. The residents have for decades quietly mined gold in this community without cause for authorities worried until the arrival of a Chinese-funded Ghanaian mining company registered as Manasseh Company Limited. The mining company started to engage in large-scale and unregulated mining operation, a situation that attracted hundreds of jobless young people to flood the community for illegal mining. By 2019, the village was completely overwhelmed by illegal miners, particularly in the wake of a security 
crack down on Galamsey activities in the south of the country. By 2020, the activity of the company had begun to attract the attention of the regional authorities after large hectares of land had been damaged, including the creation of this deep crater. According to the district chief executive, the district security council received the first official instruction to flush out the illegal miners in 2021 after the Galamsey fight was extended to the north of the country. They were illegal Chinese miners here. They were led by some uh, Ghanaians to this place. And as the campaign to uh, ensure that we eradicate illegal mining in our society, the BICEC reported to regional security, company, uh, security council and we came here. Several attempts to got them ended in vain. Anytime we are here, we can't find them, but we only find their activities. However, the D.C. revealed that the opportunity to finally flush out the illegal miners from the community came in June 2021 after a violent confrontation at the site between the local security guards and their Chinese financiers over payment irregularities. In that confrontation, the security guards were said to have attacked their Chinese masters and made away with several properties, including a large quantity of unrefined gold. The district chief executive confirmed that after the confrontation, the miners fled, following which he led the regional security task force to the site where they confiscated, among other things, several pieces of abandoned mining equipment. The team that came and sacked them, we reported to the regional coordinating council the item that had been left here. And when we came at that time, some of the items were already taken by very unscrupulous people. So we, uh, we did our assessment, we were able to identify some four excavators who were far away from here, they were hiding. But at the time that we were advised by the Regional Coordinating Council to move them to the assembly, most of the parts of those excavators were removed. It cannot be removed. So we were able to retrieve some of the items that we can send to the assembly. And most of the items that we sent to the assembly were retrieved from some people and subsequently were sent a regional coordinating council for safekeeping. However, two years after the operation, which succeeded in stopping large-scale and unregulated mining in the Nangrumah community, executives of the opposition NDC in the region are demanding an investigation as they accuse the district chief executive of selling the confiscated mining equipment. In a statement signed by the regional communications officer A.A. Gafaro, the party alleged that four excavators among the seized items were sold for 84,000 Ghana cities to individuals named Mr. Adam and Mr. Imuru. On the part that I sold uh, excavators is a big lie. I, as an individual, cannot sell an excavator. In reaction, the district chief executive denied the allegation, describing it as a complete falsehood. It's never true. I did not sell any equipment, and we did not sack these people without any reason. We sack them from here because of the campaign against illegal mining, and we want to ensure that we protect our environment. He also alleged a collusion between the illegal miners and some top executive of the NDC in the region, adding that the story should be disregarded as it was one of the diabolic efforts of the NDC to discredit the success made in the fight against illegal mining in the district. Yeah, I was not surprised because this which was coming from a political figures, opposition figures. The effort that we are putting to ensure that we protect our people, maybe they don't think of it because they did not talk about the damage these Chinese people cause here, but they rather talk about we sucking investors. And I don't think if we are looking for investors, we are looking at people who come to destroy our land this way. The investors should be benefit to the people and not to create a situation like this. But the government is not saying we should not mine, but we should mine legally. Anybody who wants to come and do mining in Mount Purugu Maduri should follow the appropriate channels, should follow the right way to acquire the right concession to come and mine. From Nanguma, Ilias Sutanko reporting for Joy News. And the interdiction of key witnesses was an affront to democracy. That's according to Atasha, the chairperson of the ad hoc committee investigating the alleged plot against the Inspector General of Police in reaction to uh, a Ghana police's uh, decision to interdict three 
of its chiefs, the police uh, officers, uh, are key witnesses in the uh, purported scheme to remove uh, Dr. George Akufo Dampari from office, which is being probed currently in Parliament, even though the decision to interdict them was reversed almost immediately. Uh, Mr. Samuel Atacha believes that uh, the decision appeared uh, as though the witnesses uh, were being intimidated. He spoke to MFR Powell on probe last night. I was very much surprised because, you see, when people have elected to testify on oath, and on their own volition. They do not have any sort hanging on their heads that, look, I mean, if you come here and you tell the truth, I mean, the powers that be might interdict you. Mm-hmm. In fact, if they knew that they could be interdicted, they wouldn't come and testify. So if you are not careful, you are on the verge of interfering with witnesses, blackmailing them or intimidating them. Well, if the other police officers who should come before the committee to testify, and we have this um, uh, clear understanding that, oh, if you open your mouth now, you'll be interdicted. Mm. Then the committee will be deprived of the benefit of witnesses who help us and aid us to come to the conclusions in terms of the findings of fact and the rest of it. So it was very, very serious. Did we, did we see that as more like an interference of the job of the committee? No dispute about it. It was a raw and direct interference with what the uh, committee was attempting to do mm. because we depend on these witnesses to work, if you care to know. It is their testimonies that we are supposed to listen in total and get to some conclusion. Mm. The people who were purported to have been interdicted were in the middle or if you like the beginning mm-hmm. of their testimony. Mm-hmm. Is it an attempt to blackmail them into keeping silent? Do you want to gag them with the fear of um, they being dealt with if they speak some more? And what is the interdiction supposed to achieve? When a committee of parliament has invited them, they didn't come to the committee on their own volition. They are obeying the powers of an arm of government. That's enshrined the constitution. Mm-hmm. A few people come to terms with the fact that when a committee of parliament is sitting, by the terms of the constitution, they have the status of a high court. Mm-hmm. They can bring witnesses to the committee they swear them on oath and the rest of it. So it was an affront to democracy that anybody attempted to, I mean, interdict the individuals whilst they were beginning to testify in the matter. And then almost immediately, almost like 24 hours, we saw a reversal of it. Did, you, did your committee interfere in any way? Do you know what led to that reversal? Well, I think um, the, 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 it dawned on those who took the decision. I don't have any insider dealing as to the, how the decision was taken. Mm. But whoever took the decision and maybe the kind of public uproar that greeted that singular decision of interdiction, they realized that it was a very serious mistake mm. and they were good enough to reverse it. So, so far, I'm glad that they saw how serious the, the interdiction vis-a-vis the, the committee's work was. They decided that they should suspend the interdiction. And it's good for everybody. Well, Mr. Tachin also took the opportunity to settle the matter on whether or not the IGP would appear before the committee. On Tuesday, all the individuals who had done what I would call the preliminary um, talking Mm -hmm. on oath will come back with their lawyers. Chief Pugrinabo, Chief P. Alexis, yes. George Mensah, yes. Manuel J.B., yes. George Asari. Sure, the four of them, mm-hmm. they should come back uh, with their lawyers. And also, the most prominent person whose name is being banded about, the IGP himself. So the IGP himself should also come with his lawyers. On and, Tuesday? On Tuesday. An invitation has been sent to him already? We've sent every invitation to all those who matter. You're giving them all the videos that we have transcribed on paper. You're giving the transcription to them. We've also done what is very, very needful. All the proceedings captured so far, we've given it to them. Mm-hmm. So that they will know who said what and who said what before they appear before Why us. Why specifically do you need the IGP in all this? Really? Well, because grave allegations have been made against him. Mm-hmm. Grave of serious consequences. And I kept telling people that the, the, the committee is not the forum to appoint an IGP. That's the first instance. Mm-hmm. And we do not have malice aforethought against the IGP. Mm-hmm. The IGP's destruction 
there's no benefit to the committee. But we won't sit down for the IGP to be disgraced and insulted without giving him a hearing. But by inviting him to, does it not hurt the institution, the Ghana Police Service? No. No. That's the thought of some people. Well, that, that, that is very banal because, you see, if we give the IGP the opportunity to hallow his name, then that is the way democracy should go. But that, his image, the reason why you are inviting him, we heard all that in public. Yes. Now you are giving him the opportunity to hallow his name in camera. Yes, because of what we consider as national security consideration. If it becomes very necessary to let the IGP speak to the cameras, why not? I'm saying that... At what point will it become necessary? Because after, most of the allegations were made in public. Well... It's out there already. Well... The, the, the allegations have been made, some serious allegations have been made in public, mm -hmm. but the substance of the allegations have not been made in public. That is to say, the evidential support for those allegations, what we are going to unnet. So which, I mean, piece of evidence should we give to the public that will not hurt national security? We'll exercise that discretion. Uh, joining us now is Richard Komodo, security consultant. Uh, thank you, uh, sir, for spending some time with us. Now it's confirmed that the IGP will be appearing before the committee. Uh, many say it's not healthy, knowing that uh, all the aggrieved factions will also be before this committee. No, definitely I disagree. The IGP should be given the opportunity to appear before the committee, uh, knowing Dan Parry for who he is and for his leadership skills. I'm not sure he's afraid of the committee. I think he will go there and speak and answer many of the questions that will be thrown against him. Remember, considering the fact that most of the things that were said on the tape were against his person and his role as an IGP, inviting him to the committee at this particular crucial time is just the right thing. Mm, uh, the decision to make that in, an in-camera hearing uh, is beginning to raise concerns. The fact that the IGP should also be given the same opportunity his uh, accusers were giving. Uh, you know, just to, just to clear their own matters. But, but it Definitely. doesn't look like that's what, what will happen based on what we're hearing from the committee chair. Definitely. I was disappointed they don't want to make the IGP here in a public uh, section. Uh, we want to hear the IGP answer those questions publicly. We don't want any third party to come and tell us what has been said and what has not been said. We want to see the IGP speak to the issues publicly. I would have loved to hear the IGP publicly speaking, addressing all the issues that were raised against him, giving him a, a hearing in camera that was disappointed in the first place. And I don't think that is the right thing to do. Blessed, I can tell you, there's nothing the IGP will say that will front on national security. After all, many of the critical things were said on the tape, and those were the national security red flags. And giving the IGP the opportunity to speak, we should be mindful that he's the head of the Ghana Police Service and putting him behind in some dark room to speak about issues where nobody will get to hear. I'm a little bit disappointed in that one. Mm. Uh, the suspension of the interdiction, now uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, Bugrin Abu who would also be appearing before the ad hoc committee and all of that. Uh, do, do you see that unifying the Ghana police service now, uh, unlike before where many were scared that, you know, that single decision uh, would, have, would have caused so much damage to the service? You see, considering what is on the tape and what we've seen so far at the public hearing, anybody with a security intelligence operations background will tell you that the IGP has three options. The first one is to interdict them, which he did. The second one is to sack them uprightly. And the third one is to put them before the law court. Having said that, he triggered the first one by interdicting them. And I was happy that the interdiction letter was rescinded. If I was to be one of them, particularly my brother JB, who has the cybersecurity department, I would have resigned. Because you know why? When you are interdicted, you can play the NDC MPP policy. Sometimes it doesn't bring you back. Many people have been interdicted. Governments have changed. IGPs have changed. They've been to court. The court said they should reinstate them. It never happened. And for him losing all his entitlements and uh, pensions and benefits, my heart goes out to him, and if I were him, or I had opportunity to advise him, I would have just said, brother, you know you crossed the red line. In line with police administration and the standard protocols that set up the law enforcement agencies, you crossed the red line, and a trapment has been set for you, 
and if this question led you to cross the red line, and you better resign. Other than that, even if you take away Dan Pari, you can't be interdicted by any other IGP, and that will not mm. be looking good for my brother. Uh, um, okay, the, but, but the service itself, do you see them in, in a better, much more better position now, knowing that uh, all this will die down, you know, the service, the morale within, within the service will, will just bounce back? It's not much about the service, but it's about the particular officers caught up in this indiscretion. I cannot imagine myself standing before Yadoko, who is the director of uh, BNI, and be suggesting names for people who should take his position. I cannot imagine an IGP, a police officer standing before Peter Nampori and suggesting names to take over from him. I think indiscretion has been the issue, and it should be a warning to all serving officers, and particularly the genius in this particular order, working for 27 years and find yourself in this particular uh, entrapment, I think it's not the right thing. And it would not affect the morale of the police officers, but it definitely it will affect the outlook and the image of the officers involved should they come back to the service. Uh, Security-wise, and, and when it comes to the aspect of probing this matter fairly, do, do you feel that it's the right decision to have all of these individuals appear before the same committee at the same time. No, definitely the IGP hold a PhD, and I believe he operates with high levels of emotional intelligence. And I don't see him throwing tantrums and being angry with that level of bitterness as we've seen so far. I think he should go with who has and answer the question. Those ones that borders on issues about him, he has the option, the, the flexibility to say, he would decline to answer those ones. But you know what is happening. Yeah? I think that BNI has done a good job on this particular issue. They have done their own investigations and they are keeping their reports close to their chest. Knowing them to be a secret society, they wouldn't release it to the general public. I see, and that, whoever that's... is interested in this result, I think they have copies of it. I, I think that's an interesting point you're raising there. If the BNI indeed knows about what's happening now, do you, do you feel that will send some of the... Security chiefs parking, dismissed probably, because at the end of the day, all of these reports will get to the president. Definitely. I wouldn't be surprised if they were all sent back home. And the interdiction letter that was sent, uh, nobody should be happy and nobody should go have a party. And uh, there might be people who are interested in this particular case. You remember when the two senior officers keep on saying they have an inter, they have an inter, they have an inter. It was one of the probings that led to the fact that it was when they got to the BNI that the name Ashanti came up, which means that independently, they were not able to crack whatever happened to them and how they were caught up in this evasive entrapment. That is to say that uh, our security officers at the highest level, uh, they are intelligence sources and access, and if Bugri Nabu happened to be one of an asset to Dampari, then you will not be wise to go speaking to him on the matter of many of the things you said. Bless it. Do you know why? If we were to be in my time in the BNI, you will be asked four questions, and the fifth one will take you to prison for five years or ten years. And the questions are going to follow this way. Do you know you are a law enforcement officer? Yes or no. Do you know Bukri Nabu and know he's a politician? Yes or no. Do you know his office and have you been there before? Yes or no. Did you speak to him about yourself and issues regarding the security agencies, either the one you work directly in or some other one, yes or no? If your answers to these questions are yes, nobody will bother to set up a committee for you and ask you whether the tape was dotted and whether did you say almost everything on the tape. You know very well at that point you have crossed the red line and you should be praying to God for mercy. Okay, so what, what it does mean is that per the code of conduct for these uh, police officers, they've already violated it one way or the other. Definitely, definitely. I'm telling you, you can even bring in the NDC, MPP policies. Everybody who works within the law enforcement agencies, you know definitely you have crossed the line. And you know when you join security intelligence, there are four things they teach you. One, you have to be invasive. Number two, you have to learn how to escape an entrapment. And number four, you need to, number four, you need to have a strong cover story. And I think many of these things, they let their guards down and it caught them off guard. You uh, remember, well, well, that yeah. was why... Peter Tobu was asking them as a law enforcement officer, when you have a problem with the IGP, have you done A? Have you done B? Have you done C? And he asked the Sari guy, going to speak about the secretary to the president, 
and the area mama in the manner you have done, creating political controversy for you. Don't you think you have crossed the line? And they should be thankful to the committee chair who sometimes step on their toes to say, don't you say, they are setting a trap for you. But because of the levels of anger, they don't listen and they are tempted to speak more. If I were to be in that position, I would have said, hey, this is an indiscretion. I find myself at the wrong side. I take fully responsible for my actions and I'm asking for mercy. Okay, that's it about the senior officers. The IGP claims subsequently we've seen um, in videos circulating on social media, allegedly, um, you know, where some claims were made that, um, for instance, there are some contracts that are being, being given, uh, individuals uh, such as Bogrina were purportedly being paid by uh, the Ghana Police Service. Are all these likely factors that could create the grounds for the president to begin to uh, commission, probably a probe into the conduct or leadership of the IGP himself? There are two things involved. If anybody tells you uh, Bukin Abu is being paid 10,000 Ghana cities by the IGP, so it's an offense, then these guys are naive and they are just woken up from sleep. The director of Vienna has so much money at his disposal and the CID boss has so much money at his disposal. National security budget is not uh, audited. And these guys have so much money that helps them to pay their assets and security informants. And that is how can they are able to operate at that level. Mm -hmm. How do you think the FBI mm -hmm. or the CIA have information all over the world? They pay for it. And there are people in this country who live by selling information. To the extent that there are some allegations of a contract, we will want to find out whether uh, some procurement breaches are okay. But hey, brother, my brother, even at the procurement committee level, at authority level, as you remember, announced from your outlook, uh, my brother and I have done jobs. And we are aware that this is the way politicians behave. And I can also tell you that the state is struggling to get people to fill in positions at the highest level. Uh, the national security coordinator is a politician. The director of BNI is a politician. They struggle to get Dan Pare to become an IGP. And a PA2 is one of the best police officers we have in this country. But you remember how he came and how he was thrown out. Then upon where you came, with contrast extensions, and then Dan Parry came. I can tell you on a fact that Dan Parry coming knows that he can be thrown out at any day. But whether you take out Dan Parry or you let him stay, we are struggling as a nation, and I think this is the first time this is happening to us. It's a wake-up call, mm -hmm. and we will need to look through and fight our way through to well, streamline okay. the operations of the national security. Uh, after, after tomorrow, what, what will be your expectation um, from the committee, first of all, from the IGP next, and from these senior police officers? No, I think from the committee level, uh, dampering appearing is a good thing to them. It will help them to have a comprehensive and a complete uh, outlook and a book that will be produced or the report to be completed that they have heard from almost everybody involved. Uh, from the IGP as a whole, I think he needs a sober mind. People have accused him of not being a frontline police officer by a small of academia. There have been allegations against him that he's killing people more than President Rawlings. He will need to look at his operational strategies again. There have been issues about he facilitated contracts to some individual politicians. He will need to think and be sober about that one. With regards to politicians and to national authority, I've had calls to speak to some few people, and I think the state is struggling a little bit. The big boys in the office of the president will need to sit up and streamline the operations of the national security institutions or the coordinated activities of these institutions have to be looked at again. And I think they will come out strongly, and those who cross the red line will need to be sent home. Uh, do, do you see that happening in this case, and who, who do you suspect might be going home at the end of the day? If, if, they, don't, if they don't act now, you see, uh, not punishable of offenses re rationalizes bad behavior and promotes awkward attitude within law enforcement agencies in particular. The young ones are watching, and the onlookers are looking to see what is going to happen. If you allow them because they play NDC or MPP political party cards, we are in this country. The tables may turn tomorrow, and it creates problems for them as individuals. People will be looking at them with some funny eyes. And I think the proper thing to do in this circumstance is to resign.
and keep your hands alive. And, and it's striking uh, learning from the, you know, the accounts that we're giving during the committee sittings that, you know, the, the position of the IGP, you'd have to lobby for it. We need reform. No, I, I, I disagree. I disagree. I, I seriously disagree. I seriously disagree. You have to lobby for it. Uh, Richard Kumado, with 28 years experience in security intelligence arena, I will not get up and lobby for any position. My uncle, Kojo Chikata, did not lobby to become national security coordinator. Mr. Chairman did not lobby to become national security coordinator. Uh, Peter Nafori did not lobby to become uh, IGP. Many of the guys who came did not lobby. And I can tell you that on authority. I think it should be more about your competence and it should be more about the favor of God. And I think we should see that position as a position of leadership and not an entitlement. To, see, to say you are an NDC member or you are an NPP member, so you are lobbying for it, it means that you are not there to serve your country and you are there to play political cards. Bless you. If you remember, before every major election, the law enforcement officers are allowed to vote a week before. That is to say that until that particular opportunity is given to you, Ghana becomes your political party and Ghana becomes your constituency irrespective of whichever political party cards you might be holding in your pocket. And I disagree seriously that you need to lobby for that position. No wonder the politicians are treating them the way they are treating them because some of them weren't selling their soul to the politicians who travel over them. And that is why we are struggling as senior law enforcement officers. And I, I always disagree with anybody who said you have to lobby for that position. Okay, um, so we'll wait to see what then happens tomorrow. Grateful for your time. This Thank afternoon. you. I'm grateful. Uh, Richard Kumando, a uh, security analyst, uh, joining us uh, in this whole conversation. Uh, the Ghana Cocoa Board is optimistic that the airport adjustment of the uh, Fung Gates price of cocoa beans by some 63.5% uh, uh, will uh, help discourage uh, cocoa farmers from uh, actually selling their arable lands to illegal uh, miners. President Akufuado announced a bag of cocoa beans will now be sold at 1,308 cities uh, for its new uh, cocoa crop season. The increment comes after uh, some cocoa farmers intensified calls for an airport review of cocoa prices to prevent uh, the prevalence of smuggling and farmers turning farmland into Galamsey sites. Uh, we'll hear from the president uh, uh, shortly uh, and also the head of the uh, cocoa board. But first, okay, let's do the president and the co-founder announcing this price. Uh, adjustment of cocoa um, in Tepa within the Ashanti region. Until recently, international prices of cocoa have remained relatively low and made worse by COVID-19. Despite of this, Cocoa Board and government have been taking the very hard decision of increasing the producer price of cocoa. Cocoa prices have increased from 7,600 CDs per ton in 2016 to 12,800 CDs per ton in 2022, a significant increase of 68%. This has had an adverse impact on Cocoa Board's financial performance. However, the sustainability of the entire industry hinges on a well remunerated producer who's willing to invest in business only when the certain that government will pay the appropriate price. The international market is beginning to pick up, and government, in keeping with our promise to our gallant cocoa farmers, has today increased cocoa prices from 12,800 CDs per ton to 20,943 CDs per ton. Or 1,308 CDs per bag. That price is 70.5 percent of the gross FOB price, and is equivalent to 1,821 dollars per ton. It is the highest to be paid to cocoa farmers across West Africa in some 50 years. With the predicted stable prices above 2,600 United States dollars threshold, the government will continue to honor our farmers with good prices in the years ahead. Indeed, better days are ahead.
heart of the illegal mining craze. Babies are being born, deformed. Their formation stages interrupted by poisonous minerals exposed by illegal mining. The baby is deformed, you can't find the sexes of the baby. The placenta had a lot of mercury and lead. But those who seek gold continue to expose the toxins that nature wants hidden. Cadmium, lead, copper, mercury, they are of alarming concern. Why you bring it up there? They are mobilized into our water bodies, and that is where we get exposed to them. The country's water bodies have become lifeless. Across Ghana, they flow like a plague, polluting the sea with a venom of illegal mining. You need about 10 to 15 micrograms per deciliter in your blood, and you are in trouble. In this documentary, Erastus Osoridonko and his team investigate how silently Ghanaians may be poisoned for gold. Poisoned for gold, coming soon. And thanks for staying with us. We can now hear from uh, Coco Bot uh, on the uh, newly adjusted uh, prices. Taking into consideration the weighted average, we say weighted average because um, I'm sure a lot of people will go on, on the internet and quote the figures at the prevailing market at international level and use it as a basis of calculating the fund base price. But the fund base price is actually determined based on sales over the years because we start selling way ahead before the season begins. So the weighted average is what is used in determining the farm gate price. When the farm gate price is, uh, is arrived, when the weighted average is arrived on, then we take into consideration other industry costs. And that has been the practice over the years. However, this year there was a change. Uh, usually, what we used to do was to take out industry costs, and then we arrive at the next FOB and a percentage not less than 15 percent is given to the cocoa farmer. Not less than 70 percent is given to the cocoa farmer. However, this year the new directive was that we should only we should give gross FOB a percentage of the gross FOB as a way of insulating farmers from any excesses in the industry cost such that farmers' income would rise. And that's all we have for you in this package of the polls and blessings. So now log on to myjoyonline.com. We have stories for you. Thanks for watching.